Hello, and welcome to the Romancing in Paris podcast. I'm your host, Lily Heisey. In this podcast, we'll be traveling around the city as I pick out my top romantic spots per arrondissement. You don't have to visit these places only as a couple. Exploring them can be the expression of your own love of Paris. Are you ready to get romancing in Paris? For this new episode, our romantic explorations of Paris continue on the left bank as we meander over to the 6th arrondissement, extending from Boulevard Saint-Michel to just past the Église Saint-Germain-des-Prés and descending from the Seine to Montparnasse. The 6th district is one of the most quintessential in all of Paris, mostly spared from Hausmann's Wrecking Ball, which altered the urban landscape of Paris in the mid-19th century. Much of the neighborhood has narrow streets and pre-revolutionary buildings, whereas a large section of the district is occupied by the gorgeous Luxembourg Gardens. Due to its historic charm and tranquility, there are many, many noteworthy romantic places in the arrondissement. So, I had some difficulty narrowing down my choice for this episode. Well, we'll have more places to visit in the next seasons of the podcast. After much debate, I couldn't resist the romantic temptation of what could be the most romantic square in all of Paris. Grab your sherry. We're heading to the Rue de Forstenbourg. While the Rue de Forstenbourg isn't a secret, it is off the well-trodden tourist path of the 6th district, which traipses past the legendary cafes of the Saint-Germain, found not a mere few streets away from our romantic square. Perhaps you've heard of this street. Perhaps you've even visited it. However, it's romantic in more than its enticing appearance. I've also uncovered some additional romantic surprises for you. Before we wind our way through the ancient streets of Saint-Germain to locate this enchanting place, I have a few clarifications to make. Firstly, one can often see two spellings for this street. It was named after the German cardinal Guillaume Egon de Furstenberg, who had the street commissioned. We'll delve more into this shortly. In German, Furstenberg is spelt with an N. However, his name was Frenchified by converting the N into an M. Therefore, the official name of this street is Rue de Furstenberg, as you can see on the street's signage when visiting it. Secondly, the Place Furstenberg doesn't actually exist in itself as an official square or place in French. The Rue de Furstenbourg runs between Rue Jacob and Rue de l'Abbaye, and closer to the latter street is this tiny square which we'll be discussing. Technically, we should be calling this spot simply Rue de Furstenbourg, but since it's this mini square, that's the magical part of the street. For our purposes, I'll still refer to it as a square. For centuries, the surrounding land was outside the boundaries of Paris, which were eventually confined by the city walls, as I've elaborated on in previous episodes of both Romancing in Paris and my other podcast, Paris Cachet. In fact, the Wall of Philippe Auguste, dating back to the turn of the 13th century, stood a stone's throw from our location. But let's go back in time even further than the construction of the wall. Back in the mid-6th century, a royal abbey called the Basilique Saint-Croix et Saint-Vincent was founded southwest of here. 
the precursor to the current Église Saint-Germain-des-Prés. Extremely prestigious, it was the necropolis for French royalty until the construction of the Basilica of St. Denis, where the tombs of most French royals are still found to this day. Over time, the abbey grew in size and power. Its buildings increased, and it became its own walled-in enclave, as well as owning a vast swath of land from here west to where the Eiffel Tower is today. We could talk about the abbey for hours, but since its history isn't all that romantic, and is less relevant to the story of our square, I'm going to skip ahead a few centuries. In 1586, a new abbatial palace was built, the second building in Paris made of brick, a building material which became popular over the next few decades, as seen in Place Dauphine and Place des Vosges. A hundred years later, in 1697, the German cardinal Guillaume Egon de Furstenburg, formerly the Bishop of Metz and of Strasbourg, was appointed abbey of the Saint-Germain-des-Prés Abbey. In order to have easy and more direct access to his palace, Furstenburg had three streets created, Rue Cardinal, Passage de la Petite Boucherie, and Rue de Forsenbourg. The latter extended to the forecourt of the palace, where the abbey's stables were situated, the location of our little square. In fact, some of the stable buildings still exist. We'll get around to talking about those when we enter the square virtually. The street changed names, like many places in France, during the revolution and then after the restoration of the monarchy, it returned to its original name, Rue de Furstenbourg. The most exciting thing to have probably happened to the square was the arrival of its most famous resident, Eugène Delacroix, one of the key artists of the Romantic era. Another reason why the square is romantic an artist active from the 1830s to the 1860s, today he is best known for his epic painting, Liberty Leading the People, hanging across the river at the Louvre. A noted painter during his lifetime, in 1857, Delacroix rented out an apartment at number 68 of this street in order to be closer to the Église Saint-Sulpice, which is found around a ten-minute walk away, and where the artist was working on the commission of three large frescoes. His apartment faced the interior courtyard of the building, and Delacroix thus had a studio built for himself overlooking this peaceful setting. We're going to talk more about Delacroix and his romantic intrigues shortly. We'll be right back with Romancing in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Romancing in Paris. After Delacroix passed away in 1863, the pointillist artist Paul Signac, a big fan of Delacroix's, occupied his studio. He advocated for it to be preserved as an homage to Delacroix, and his efforts were instrumental in having the space converted into a museum in 1932. Interestingly, two other famous artists also had studio space in a different part of the building, Claude Monet and Frédéric Basil, in 1865, leading up to Impressionism. The little square doesn't look like it's changed much since then. Let's take a stroll down it, and I'll give you a little more information. The square is magical both day and night. So you can really visit it any time, that is, depending on if you'd like to visit the Delacroix Museum or not. 
I suggest approaching the street from Rue Jacob, just as Cardinal de Furstenbourg would have. This way, you'll have the best wow factor. Descending the street, you'll pass by some of the chic design shops the Saint-Germain district is known for. You can always stop for some window shopping. That is, if you haven't already been captivated by the street's star attraction, the jewel box square. As you near the tiny place, you'll notice its central median, which has a gorgeous vintage lamppost and several paulina trees, which explode in beautiful mauve blossoms in late spring. In the distance is the backdrop of muted red, the brick abbatial palace, which has, fittingly, returned to its religious roots as the home of the Institut Catholique de Paris, a Catholic university. When you reach the square, turn around and look back at the building on the left-hand corner of the square. On number four, Rue de Furstenbourg, you can find a base relief from the 17th century, a pot au feu, a stew pot. On the other side of the square, a number 10, is also a beautiful base relief depicting painting. In the middle of these is a brick building, what's left of the palace's stables. In addition to housing the Delacroix Museum, there's also a lovely flower shop called Flamand, a potential perfect stop on your romantic stroll. Hint, hint. The Delacroix Museum is worth visiting for a number of reasons. Ideal for anyone interested in art, it is simply a beautiful space, especially thanks to its alluring garden, where you can have a little lover's break. As I alluded to before, the fact that Delacroix was part of the Romantic movement also adds merit for including the museum in your romantic itinerary. But I also did some digging around. I thought such a passionate painter, who was also quite a good-looking man, must have had mm, other passions in life. Indeed, I uncovered more than I had bargained for. Firstly, Delacroix himself might have been born out of passion. Delacroix was the son of a late 18th century politician and diplomat, Charles Francois Delacroix. Or was he? Rumors of the time attempted to claim that he was born out of an affair between his mother, Victoire Aubin, and the famed statesman, Talleyrand, who, among other prestigious roles, held the title of the President of the French Assemblée Nationale and a number of high-level ambassadorial posts. He was also known for his numerous lovers. Oh la la! Whether or not he was Eugène Delacroix's father, lovers was one thing they had in common. Eugène never married. It would seem that he had completely dedicated himself passionately to his art. However, he did have a number of passionate relationships, usually kept rather hush-hush, but which were revealed posthumously in his personal letters and diary, artist models, a famous ballerina, high society women, including one who was considered the most beautiful of the times. He and Georges Sand, one of the most prominent writers of the Romantic era, were also very, very close, and some assumed were indeed lovers. Oh la la, Delacroix! Even if you don't visit his museum, you can imagine the life and times of this secret romantic as you're visiting the square. 
That said, I'm not so sure if Cardinal Furstenberg would have approved of Delacroix's liaisons. Regardless of their differing personalities, they are both intrinsically linked to this oh-so-picturesque square. While these images are still dancing through your head, turn back to the square. Although it wasn't immortalized on Delacroix's paintings, it did appear on the silver screen in two films. Vincente Minnelli's 1958 film Gigi and Martin Scorsese's 1993 pick The Age of Innocence, which features the street in the last scene of the movie. Your visit, too, will hopefully leave you with a lasting impression, as well as spark some romance. Before coming to the square, especially if you think you'll go to the Delacroix Museum, you could swing by the nearby location of La Durée for a treat to enjoy in the museum's garden. Or you can also carry on your stroll to the Place Saint-Sulpice, further south in the district, another square which I also find romantic, but most importantly, where you can visit the marvellous frescoes Delacroix was working on while living in the square. Thank you for listening to this latest edition of Romancing in Paris. If you've enjoyed it, please subscribe. That way you won't miss the next episode. Ratings or reviews are also very, very appreciated. Thank you for sharing the love. If you would like to discover more romantic places in the 6th District, see my website jetemmeneither.com for my ultimate romantic guides to the top romantic spots per arrondissement of Paris. This podcast was produced by Paris Underground Radio. Check out their website if you're interested in listening to more great podcasts on Paris, including my other podcast, Paris Caché, which explores even more lesser-known and hidden places in the city. Until next time... Happy romancing in Paris.